Hello guys and welcome to today's Los Blancos podcast. Today we'll be discussing some more transfer rumours, our defensive crisis, a Shakhtar preview and also whether we are right to let go of Sergio Ramos. Now, Sean hasn't been here in a couple of weeks so let's all welcome him back today. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy. Please like and subscribe and let's get straight into the podcast. Okay, in today's podcast, we're going to do the first section, which is some more transfers. Now, we do this section quite a lot and I've done it in recent weeks. However, there have been some really fresh new rumours and I think it's appropriate for us to do it now. So, without further ado, the first player we have is a player that's... That's recently come up on most people's radars because of his impressive performances for France and for Monaco. It is Aurelien Chouameni. Now, this season he's been really, really good. He's been an outstanding player for Monaco. Monaco haven't been doing exceptional in Ligue 1, it has to be said. But I think he's been the standout player for Monaco. So what do you think of Aurelien Chouameni? Okay, first of all, um, when this rumor came out, I heard many people saying um, we don't need him because we have a lot of midfielders and we have a lot of um, um, we need to focus on signing defenders like in centre back and in right back. So I'm not going to discuss the need for the position. I'm going to discuss how he was fitting into the squad and how important he can be. Um, so firstly, um, I the first time I had a proper look at him was in the Nations League against Spain. Um, of course, in that game, Spain had much of the ball, and uh, we didn't get to see his on the ball ability as much as we would like in that game. However, he is actually a good, a really good um, midfielder. When Pogba actually said, "I would like to play with him more," so that maybe shows um, how um, how much of a relief he can be in terms of allowing Pogba to maybe have that freedom to push up. So that's me. That's what he brings to the team. He is not a definite like for like Casemiro replacement, but he does have a lot. He does have a lot of of, of energy, you know, to help his midfielders. You know, he has that he works hard. And he's really good in positioning and interception. So I think he would he would be a good addition to the squad um, to fit in at Real Madrid. Um, so maybe it would definitely affect Antonio Blanco and he have to go out on loan and then the two year loan deal is option to buy and those buy him clothes, etc. You know, so of course um deals like that will affect our younger players. So what do you think about his ability? Like can you discuss his style of play a bit more in extent for me? Yeah, okay, so with Germany, we've we've spoken about um Casemiro and uh, replacement for Casemiro in the coming years. And we talked about we're not going to be able to find the Casemiro replacement exactly because the destroyer type midfielder is running out in in recent years. You know, we've been looking at more like Busquets type midfielders, the ones that try to dictate the play rather than, you know, being an out and out defensive mid- midfielder just trying to win the ball back. And I think sure many is going to be the closest we can really get to a Casemiro like for like replacement because... The guy is an exceptional defender. He, he makes 4.13 tackles per game and he wins 2.87 of those per game, which, you know, these are exceptional numbers, and for, especially for a, a defensive midfielder. You know, you spoke about how Pogba likes playing with him. You know, he, he's going to re- relieve a lot of pressure on um, Kamavinga and Valverde if, they, if they're caught out of position. So I think... With him, you know, he's he he can dribble out of um, when he's pressured, and I think one of the most outstanding facts about him, I saw this on Twitter, was basically he he wins more fouls than he draws. So he's he's won, uh, where is it, two point one eight fouls per game, and he he gives away one point six, which you know for a player like him who you know, tends to make a lot of challenges and tries to win the ball back a lot. This is it's, it's an exceptional stat. So I think it shows he's, he's more elegant than Casemiro and he's more, you know, he's he's, he's more of a, a dribbler and a more he's got more technical ability than Casemiro. So we're never going to get that like like replacement with Casemiro. But I think sure many, he would be a very, very good replacement. And you spoke about Antonio Blanco's development I think you know these two. They're, they're they're pretty different in terms of their style of play. So, I think you know 
going against this opponent, we play uh, Antonio Blanco. This opponent, we play Shuameni. It would be a good idea, maybe, because if, if it, in one of the games where we need more energy in midfield, we could play Shuameni. Some games where we need to like um, control the game, you would play Blanco. So I think these two could rotate eventually, I think. But in terms of a midfielder for the next 10 years, Shuameni is going to be up there, definitely. So... Do you think that Shuameni has the ability to be the defensive midfielder for Real Madrid in the next 10 years, maybe? Yeah, of course. Um, in the game against Spain, like I said, I was looking a lot um, at his positioning as well because he was quite a new player to me and I definitely wanted to have a look at him. Um, and I think he was actually really good, um, like I said, in terms of his positioning when he had the ball on his feet. I think he did really well and I think that um, he definitely, if he has a chance at Madrid, you know, he can do well. Uh, if Madrid can sign him, of course, we don't know how he will play in a Real Madrid team. So maybe it could be a low another option to buy just in case it doesn't work out. But I'm sure that it can work out. He definitely seems like he is um, that kind of Real Madrid player because Real Madrid likes those midfielders, you know, who can play from deep with a bit of aggression, like, you know, like Makalele in the past and the Xabi Alonso a bit. Um, he wasn't that aggressive, but he could have been aggressive, Xabi Alonso. Uh, no, then Casemiro, now we have now him. So, uh, you, you you actually touched on Antonio Blanco and you said that, you know, they have a lot of different playing styles. I think, um, obviously, you can also mention Camavinga as well, who has a different playing style to Antonio Blanco at the start of the season. Um, there were many reports saying that Blanco would have minutes. Um, he would get many minutes under his belt. Ancelotti likes him a lot. Then Camavinga was signed, and it was Antonio Blanco is not going to get plenty minutes um, because um, of Camavinga's arrival. Then you heard, then you also heard another report saying, I'm not too sure if you remember that Carlo Ancelotti still has a lot of faith in Antonio Blanco, and yeah. the arrival of Camavinga changes nothing. But I think it did because. Camavinga is obviously a better player than Antonio Blanco and of course when you're going to replace a player um, of course you can just change the system a bit you know um, and play the better player if you understand what I mean mm -hmm. you know for example if you have two players and one player is better you're going to play the better player and have slight adjustments to the system I think that's what's going on and if, if he is signed Antonio Blanco will be affected again so um I know that the playing style is different. I know that we can utilize one against against um, different oppositions, you know. But I think it definitely will affect his his development. Um, I think Blanco's development will be affected, and that's not a reason to not sign a player. For example, if you tell me that, if you tell me that, if we sign Mbappe, Vinicius will be affected a bit. But Mbappe is a better player than Vinicius, so you're going to take the opportunity to sign. A world class player in Mbappe. If you if you which was playing well and you tell me if we sign Haaland it's going to affect Luka Jovic, but Haaland is a better player than Jovic. So you know you will take these opportunities, but the difference is you're not going to take the opportunity if it's a lot of money. For example, if, if I'm seeing um it's thirty million I'm seeing is the cost for which is good and we can sign them if we fulfill our priorities and sign them players in other positions, he would be a good addition to the squad. So, for example, if you tell me it's going to take 60 million to sign to sign them, I would say no. We have Antonio Blanco, we have Camavinga, Van Vliet, etc. That's a lot of money for an unnecessary position. But if you t if you tell me 20 million, 30 million, I'll say yes, of course, let's sign them. Um, we have a lot of players in that position, but he can definitely improve the position for a cheaper cost. But in terms of you're talking about the future, yes, he can definitely uh, contribute to this team. Um, especially with the kind of energetic players we have in Kamavinga, um, Valverde, like um, he can definitely assist. And if you're going to sign players like Kylian Mbappe and Paul Pogba, I think he can be a good addition. Because if you look at the PSG squad now, um, he can definitely fit into the PSG squad because of his work rate um, and Messi, Neymar, Mbappe. They don't do, they don't do much defending, so. So um, he would definitely be a good addition there. I think the same thing could apply to Real Madrid, especially if Mbappe is signed, Haaland is signed. If we have all those attackers, he can be a good addition. 
but personally for me i think he might go to psg maybe next year um because um pochettino is a smart guy and he might think you know messi neymar and mbappe that's too much i need um midfield reinforcements and i think he might go to psg i'm not going to discuss that too much because this is a real Madrid podcast but yeah, he would be a good addition to this team yeah i agree with you so yeah, um, I'm just going to quickly talk on the money before we move on to our next player. We, uh, basically, it, 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 Monaco are demanding £60 million. However, as we saw last season with uh, Kamavinga, they uh, Ren demanded something like, what was it, 60 to £70 million. And later on, the contract expiring, no play, uh, no clubs wanted to pay last year, so Ram just swooped in thirty million, easy, easy buy. So I think I'm not sure when his contract is ending, but I think it could happen a similar situation here. I don't think he's worth sixty to seventy million at this point in his development, but if if in a, for any year's time, you know, we we see thirty million an opportunity to buy a future world class player. I think we've got to take it regardless of whether it affects Blanco's development or not because I really like Blanco but I think that opportunity is too good to turn down and too good to let someone like PSG or Man United to come in and take that opportunity. Yeah, of course, of course and especially with Modric and Tony Cruz getting older of course there will be opportunities for players like this thing that maybe they would need to fight a bit more but um, that's definitely going to make the squad a lot stronger. And of course, you could always tell Blanco for maybe a good bit of money and have a buyback clause at the end of it, you know, and then he can develop more somewhere else. Of course, it's sad, but that happens a lot in football. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to move on to my uh, next player, which is Pedro Porro of Sporting CP. Now, basically, this season he's been he's he's had four starts, three sub appearances, and he's got two goals and one assist this season. And Pedro Porro is a player that really intrigues me because the guy is a, obviously a very very good player. Now, a couple of days ago there there was a rumor basically that his um his granddad said that he would never join Real Madrid but recently he's he's um, come out to deny that publicly and i think that that signifies a little bit of interest on Pedro Porro's side that he wants to go to Real Madrid and i think personally i would love to see Pedro Porro at, uh, at Real Madrid you know i've seen him in there for sporting i've watched a few sporting matches and he he just looks so good now. Bearing in mind he does play wing back for Sporting, you know Sporting play five at the five at the back, so you know he he's going to be a bit more attacking. But I think this guy is he's a very good player, and his right back is a position that we could do with a bit of strengthening, you know, with the Carver House injury issues. And I just don't feel confident whenever Lucas Vasquez or Nacho plays. You know, they could put a good performance in, but they could also put a stinker in. So, what do you think on Pedro Porro? Okay, um, so actually I think that obviously definitely Real Madrid need a fullback because Carvajal has been injured a lot. Um, Lucas Vasquez can be a good deputy, but I'm obviously not the biggest fan of Lucas Vasquez being um, when he's playing at right back. Of course, it works out sometimes on occasions and sometimes it doesn't. I'm also not the biggest fan of Nacho playing at fullback as well. So I think he definitely could be a good addition into the squad. Um, however, I really hope that Audrey Zola um, improves a lot in Italy. So when he comes back to Madrid, he definitely can have a chance of, you know, trying to win a starting spot. You know, I hope he does so well in Italy, Audrey Zola, because that's a player I like. Um, so what do you think, um, in terms of Pedro Poe, if we have a chance to sign him for a cheap course? Yeah, I think we should because, of course, we need to um, have Kabat right back. We need to um, improve the position. Um, but what do you think about his defensive abilities? Because that's definitely what caused the Jews at the end of his of his Madrid um, of his Madrid spell. So do you think that Pedro, because he's a full a wing back, I should say, do you think that do you think that that's actually um, going to affect him if he comes to Madrid? He might be a bit um, has a lot of defensive lapses that can cost him. I mean. We haven't seen much of his defensive ability at Sporting, you know. Obviously, playing as a wing back, his um his defensive problem maybe potential problems are covered by the right centre back who plays for Sporting. So we we don't get to see his defensive abilities on show much. But I think 
you know, if we are to sign a dominating centre back, which we will discuss a little bit later in this section, um, you know, he, it, could, it will recover his defensive, you know, shortness. You know, we've seen Trent Alexander Arnold at Liverpool, for it, for example, where his defensive abilities, you know, his one on one ability is pretty good, but, you know, he can be caught out of position quite a lot. And I think Van Dyke just completely covers that. And I think. If we had buy a centre back like Van Dyke, because you know, and let, let me just be clear, Van Dyke is a very, very, very good centre back. So finding a centre back like Van Dyke is going to be very, very difficult. However, if we find a centre back like Van Dyke who is is dominating and will just win the ball back, if a, if someone's dribbling at him, then I think you know Pedro Porro's defensive abilities will be covered. So. I think Pedro Porro, you know, he he's got two key passes per game this season, you know. And that's the same as Eden Hazard and you know, and Mod he's more than Modric and Vinicius, you know, and that's all from right wing back. So if I think, you know, his attacking abilities they're they're very, very good and it's very clear that Pep Guardiola and Man City do not want him and they do not like him at, at all. You know, they could have brought him back last season as as um as depth, you know, he did really well last season for sporting. So I think, you know, they could have brought him back for this season, but they clearly didn't want to, and they've extended the loan with Sporting. So I think, you know, it's waiting for someone to come and uh, come in and swoop for him, you know, 20 million. I think that would be enough. You know, it, it is a very, very small amount of money for a very, very good wing back. But I think, you know, we haven't seen much of him, and obviously he does play in Liga Nos. So what do you think on Pedro Porro's you know, value for money? Yeah, and it's quite cheap as well. Yeah, twenty million is not bad. You know, like I said, um, you know, um, obviously, um, it could depend a lot on Uji as well. But of course, you have to look forward. And if you're getting him for twenty million, he can definitely improve. Um, that's going to be um great actually. I think with Manchester City, I think maybe it's a similar situation to like Angelino the last time when he did well and they brought him back. And he maybe didn't get the game time that he needed. So maybe man, they're just like, you know, um, let's not go through that again and just sell them and uh, make the money. Because they have two excellent right backs and Kyle Walker and Cancelo, maybe in the top five in the world. So it's not necessary to sign another fullback maybe in that position. So I think that's maybe why the cost is so cheap as well, because he won't be an important player in the squad there. So and his value definitely to Manchester City and would be a lot lower than his value to a team like Sporting, actually. So I think, I'm not too sure if um, the release goes from Manchester City to Sporting is 20 million. I think Sporting will definitely activate it. And obviously they will demand uh, more more than um, the amount that they paid for him. Because I think it's a, it's a clause um, in the loan. Um, one of the latest articles that I saw on him. It's a clause that Sporting will most likely activate and then they will sell him on their terms. Yeah, I mean, if we, if we just match that clause when, when Sporting go in for him, I'm sure a decision between Real Madrid and Sporting, Club de Portugal, no no offence to for Sporting, they're a fantastic club, but I think Pedro Porro will have his mindset on that. So I think, realistically, he's he's a very good fullback, but I think, you know, defensive abilities could be a problem in this. So... Uh, let's move on to but next before, before we move on, I saw um, um, you know who would be a good right back signing. I saw with um, with the Chelsea's hazard interest, which was obviously fake. Um, that is streams. Uh, they are much of enough ones with streams, and that wouldn't be a bad deal in my opinion. But... Yeah, with Rhys James, it's, it's just it's not very it's not going to be very realistic, is it? I mean, with Chelsea, yeah, no, Chelsea, you're gonna just is. want him because he he's a very very good fullback, you know. I've seen him so much of him, and he's just he's he's every time he plays, he's just fantastic. He gets up and down that right wing, you know, he's dominating, and he's and he's one on one is just he's very so he's just very good fullback. So I think. You know, Chelsea are going to be demanding a very, very hefty price if we're going to be looking in for Rhys James. OK, but if we can get him for Hazard, then that's going to be excellent, <laughs> yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, OK, so let's move on to Edinson Cavani. Now, with Edinson Cavani, there's only been a rumour that he'd, he'd come in uh, for loan in January. Uh, I mean, I, th I would take it on loan, you know. It depends on the wage, you know, because the wage contribution, because... 
Edin Sigovani, at this age, he's, he's still a very, very good player. And he's, he's one of the legendary strikers at this point in his career. So I think, you know, ultimately, he's, a, he's still very, very good. He's, and as a backup to Benzema, it's not a bad option. Because especially, if, you know, say if Benzema got injured, you know, with the contribution he's putting forward right now, replacing him with the orbit of Mariano is just not going to be very, very possible. So I think bringing in Edinson Cavani, who won't give you as much um, goal contribution as, as um, Benzema. However, he's as hard of a worker. And I think his movement's fantastic still. So I think, you know, Edinson Cavani on loan for six months until maybe we buy Haaland or someone, then I think it's a good idea. What do you think on Edinson Cavani? Yeah, of course, you know, and one thing about Cavani that I also like is that he also works for his teammates. I think um, he can also um, play in, like, a, a front two, um, or he can also, like, you know, adjust a bit, you know, to help his strike partner get more goals. He did that with Suarez a lot um, for Uruguay, for Zlatan, his PSG, you know, so I definitely think he can do the same for Benzema. Um, I think he is a more adaptable player than Luka Jovic. Um, so that's what's going to make him a bit um, more useful for a team like Real Madrid. So I think Cavani would definitely be a good addition to the squad. Um, but personally for me, it's not that I won't take him. Um, I think he would be um, a good addition, like I said, um, for the, especially if it's just for six months. You know, But maybe we may need to find a landing spot for Luka Jovic, maybe for another six-month loan deal. Um, definitely that would affect Jovic, in my opinion. Uh, I think if Luka Jovic leaves again this time, it's definitely going to be the end um, of his Real Madrid career, in my opinion. Um, so Cavani coming in, I think he will fit in at Madrid. So if there's an opportunity to sign him for six months, I think it's going to be unlikely because he may just stay at Manchester and leave at the end. Um, I think Madrid targets will be different come the end of the season. So maybe I just think it's an opportunity to pass upon. Um, maybe if Luka Jovic get, gets a bit frustrated and wants to leave, um, I think yeah we can sign Cavani um, and um, and keep him for six months. But I just think um, Luka Jovic can definitely get better. I've seen some glimpses of him in some of the games where he was a bit unlucky. So um, I'm having more and more hope um, from last season with Jovic. So I definitely think that Cavani would be a good addition. But I've been seeing you which doing some stuff that's definitely um, making me have a bit of hope. Um, so I just think that Jovic can be that guy. In my opinion, I think I think maybe he will get a chance shortly and hope that he can take it. So he Jovic is making small steps forward. So because of that, I will pass on the Cavani opportunity if it comes up. Okay, so let's move on to our next player. We had a debate on already, which is Pepe. Now, it's not Nicolas Pepe, it's good old Pepe from Porto. So, obviously, we've, we've already spoken about him. Um, I think he's a, he would be a fantastic addition in January if we got him like 5 to 10 million. It would be a fantastic addition. You know, Porto, I don't think, would refuse that amount of money for a 38-year-old. Um, but I think, you know... The problem with our defence at this moment in time, we lack leadership and organisation. I think one thing that Pepe will guarantee is, is you know, he will just like, he will organise the defence once again. You know, he, he will tell his, his partner to stay back and it'll go when, whenever he needs to. And he and he'll get his everything onto it. He'll throw, put his body on the line. He'll do anything for, for the club he plays for. So I think, you know, he, that in that way, he's also, he, he's, a, he's a fantastic player still. And I think... One thing that we lack with Alaba and and um, and Militao is and Nacho um, is that fear factor when it goes to the striker. You know, when the striker goes to um, when the striker is playing the centre back. You know, I think that fear factor. You know, oh no, I don't want to go against Pepe. He's gonna kick my shin, shins in. Um, I don't want to play against Pepe, and I think we've lacked that with Alaba and. And Militao, you know, these these two are pretty nice people. They look pretty nice anyway. And I think, you know, if we just have Pepe just to strike fear, fear into the op opponents, I think that would help a lot, you know. I think, you know, opposition teams aren't too scared to go at us. And I think 
if if we brought in someone like Pepe, you know, a warrior, then I think, you know, he could be a very, very good addition. Yeah, definitely. I, of course, I'm not against um, the fact that he can be a good addition. I think that definitely um, he brings qualities that no one else in this team has, and that's definitely going to improve the squad. Um, it's going to, obviously, if we sign him, it's definitely going to be for just a year. Um, so I think Pepe will definitely help out the team in that respect in terms of leadership because, of course, um, he's doing that at Porto at the moment. Um, what I said, that when, we, when we spoke about Pepe, I said I brought up the Germany game um, mm-hmm. in the US. And Pepe, um, of course, um, I just think that the line, the high line that Real Madrid plays, I just think it's definitely um, going to affect them a lot. However, if we have Mendy and Carvajal, um, two defensively solid fullbacks that can definitely make it make life easier for Pepe. So I think um, definitely um, he would be a good addition for, like I said, the Germany game in the US. Obviously, um, Germany on every time Kai Havertz had the ball going at him, I was just a bit worried or Nabi going at him, you know, because of course I wanted Portugal to win that game, of course, but um, I was looking at every Germany counter attack. Um, Serge Nabe versus Pepe and it just seemed like an absolute, mis- absolute mismatch in my opinion and I was and I was thinking you know what if that happens at Madrid you know um, and, one, and like a fast fullback keeps going at the move and over again we will be exposed so that's the only reason I will pass on the opportunity but however um, he does bring a lot of qualities to this team he's definitely not going to start however if there's a need for him to start I think he Maybe he can be better, he will be better and play, in my opinion. I think that he is still maybe a better centre back on some occasions than Nacho. I think Militao is ahead of him, but Pepe, like you said, he's a good leader, etc. And he can organise the defence like he's doing at Porto. Um, if you look at the Juventus game on last day, I think he was so good um, defensively as well. So he can definitely contribute in games where Madrid has set him back a lot. Um, of course, he's better than Vallejo. I've seen yesterday about Vallejo's looking hard, etc. But Pepe is better than Vallejo, so um, he, he would be a good addition. And if we can get him um, to help us until we sign another centre, I'm going to mention this along with Sergio Ramos. Maybe he can, you know, he can just be there until we can sign a better centre back in Kunde when we have the funds to do it. So yeah, of course, I think uh, Pepe would be a good addition because, of course, he's better than Vallejo, and you have to improve the squad so if you can bring them in then yeah you can yeah i mean with this rumor ain't in particularly real i saw it on twitter it wasn't a very very trusty um source so you know don't expect this to happen exactly unless the rumors ex- escalate within the next week or something but i think pepe uh, uh, is would be a fantastic addition i think you know as you said he's better than vallejo in my opinion he's better than nacho and I think he's roughly the same sort of uh, position as Militao at this point because, you know, I think that Militao is still a fantastic defender and I think, you know, pace and uh, that way, you know, on that side of the uh, defending, you know, Militao is obviously much, much better than Pepe at this point. But, you know, in terms of out and out defending and getting your head onto things and stopping the, def- the attacker from getting past, I... You can't argue for either of them, really. I think they're at this point they're both at the same stage. I think Militao will obviously get better, and you know he he will eventually be become Roundridge's main centre back alongside someone else. But I think Pepe would be a nice addition in January for, as you said, a one year deal maybe until we sign someone better. You know maybe Paul Torres, maybe like Laporte, like I suggested last week. Um, no, not last week, two weeks ago. So, yeah, OK, so have you got anything else on Pepe before we move on? No, no, like, yeah, yeah, I think he just hit the nail on the head there when you said that the yeah, Militao is on the same level. Militao is just a bit more aggressive, but, yeah, um, I think um, he'd be a good addition. I think that's sad than Pepe. Yeah, OK, so next we have Christopher Nkunku, who's, who's been doing extraordinary for Leipzig this season. Eight goals, one assist in ten appearances in all competitions. 
and one of those was that extraordinary hat trick where they lost against Man City. So I think you know he's clearly outperforming the rest of his teammates at Leipzig, and he's becoming the next big talent at Leipzig. You know, you've also seen Dominic Sabozlai, uh, who's also playing extraordinarily for Leipzig. So I think you know some of these players at Leipzig are always going to have interest. You know, Danny Olmo as well. You know, looking pretty good this season. And um, so I think, you know, Nkunku's just playing very, very good. However, I just don't think that number 10 role is going to be fulfilled at Real Madrid ever again. I don't think, you know, it might it might eventually come back, but I, I, I don't think, you know, within the next, the next five, ten years, I, I just don't see a number 10 role coming in for Real Madrid. So what do you think on Christopher Nkunku? I think he's uh, definitely a player who has improved a lot since he left PSG. But in terms of Nkunku, I think that, like you said, um, I don't think that there would be a position for him in the team. Yeah, he definitely started the season well, but maybe there will not be a position in the team um, where he can show um, his best qualities. And, you know, that maybe um, he may have to be pushed out wide and that's going to affect him just like that at PSG. Of course, he was younger back then and maybe now he can. Now maybe now he can improve, but I think I think that he will not be um, a success or well, an immediate success. I would say at Madrid because of you know the his position doesn't exist actually. However, he's really good at running behind, and of course um, he obviously will bring something different to the team. And of course, if you can expand the versatility of the team and gives functional flexibility to the team, that's going to be that's going to be great for me. I think if we can get him for a cheap cost, then yeah, I think it's, it's something we can experiment with. Um, if it's cheap, then we can experiment with the signing and said, you know what, let's see how um, how this team can play. Um, because he is definitely a goal scorer, he can run in behind and score goals. So, to be honest, because I said I would like the team to be a bit more flexible in the options. Because on some occasions, the team do struggle to do something different. Um, like in the Espanyol game and a few of the other games um, where we lost. So I think he can definitely contribute to that. Of course, um, we're going to say that there isn't a role for him, which I completely understand. And maybe maybe that's why it makes sense not to sign him. But a lot of times um, in games where Madrid was struggling, um, especially the season, I'm not going to speak much about this season because it hasn't been like too much. But where, where Madrid needed a goal, I think he can definitely be a player, you know, um, to you know, score that goal maybe in the 68th minute when the team is struggling um, due to moments of intelligence um, and his attacking instinct, you know, to give us that goal because of uh, we don't have a player like him in the squad. I think he will definitely, you know, give us something different. But if you're going to sign him and you're going to play him out wide, you know, then it doesn't make any sense to sign him. Yeah, I mean, one thing he does guarantee is goals from midfield, which we have not had since um, James Rodriguez, maybe. I mean, it's not guaranteed with James, but he also guarantees a lot of create direct creativity. You know, obviously, Modric and Cruz are very, very creative players, but they're not directly giving the assist. or, or the, And that's what, you know, Nkunku specialises in. He, he's got five pre- shot-creating actions this just this season so i think you know per per game i mean um so i think he's he's doing very well for for leipzig and uh, long may that continue but i just don't think he's perfect for Real Madrid, and i think you know Bayern will eventually get him uh, it just seems like a perfect transfer for Bayern munich just to swoop in for 30 million offer for a free when his contract expires so yeah, let's move on to our next players. Yeah, and these are just a few, you know, names. Just and uh, we'll just rattle them off. So, Raheem Sterling, he's a, he's obviously the second top stro- scorer ever for City. Did extremely well for uh, at, the, at the Euros for England this summer, and he used to top scorer for England. He was very very good. Um, but he he's, he's fallen out of favour for City. I just don't think he's exactly rounded type. You know, he's got he's not. He's not clinical at this point in his career, you know. He, he, uh, I always, you know, whenever I watch Man City, he always takes the extra touch when he, when he doesn't need to. And I, th- I think he's just, he's, his decision-making is not particularly great. And I don't think we need 
another headache up front, to be honest, and to Raheem. You know, maybe someone else like um, Barcelona would go for him if they sold someone else, but struggle to see them get the money. But yeah, um, I just don't think he's Real Madrid material. So what do you think on Raheem Sterling? Yeah, only if maybe he wants to be like a right winger, um, because we have a lot of left wingers. I think maybe if he accepts the fact that you know he's going to play as a right winger, and he comes in as a cheap cost, then maybe I can I would say yes. To it. But um, I don't think that he is a real Madrid type of player, especially because we have been this year Sam Chico as well, uh, who can definitely play high up the high up the pitch on the left wing with Benny and on the right wing with Chico. So I don't think that he'll be a good addition to the squad. I know that you're going to mention Key as a um, later on as well. So let me just um, mention that one as well immediately. But Key is a, um, I would say yes to Key is a because of course he is. Um, he actually can play in deeper positions as well. He's a bit more versatile. He can play left midfield, right midfield, um, even at a full, even at a wing back in a few occasions, and definitely as a out and out winger because he can actually drop in field and. He's so good technic and technically, um, technically that he can evade players with ease and he can, with, with you know that chop of the shoulder and he's so good um, in, in positions as well. So that's why maybe I will say yes to Keza and no to Sterling just because Keza is so much more versatile and he can play um, on both wings at full effect. You know he's also a good finisher as well. He can create something out of nothing. Um, I don't think Sterling can do, can do that, in my opinion, compared to Keza. So that's why I would say Keza would be a good addition to the squad, but it's unlikely we're going to sign him because of the amount of money you pay with one. So um, that's a bit unrealistic for me. Um, yeah. Still, I mean, uh, Sterling definitely won't fit. So. Yeah, uh, we might as well move to Keza as well, but um, Keza is just simply world class, and I think. You know, personally, I would have had him as one of the bundle candidates, but he hasn't even been nominated, which is kind of ridiculous, to be honest, in my opinion. You know, alongside someone like uh, uh, Thomas Muller hasn't been nominated, uh, Kimmich hasn't been nominated, uh, Goretzka hasn't been, has he? I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, Cruz hasn't been nominated. It's just... Um, Mendy as well, the goalkeeper. Yeah, me, um, for, um, Edouard Mendy, who had an absolutely stunner yesterday against Brentford, it has to be said. I watched it and I, I was just shocked how Brentford could not score there. And it was just men, Mendy's ex, extremely good performance. So I think, yeah, Chiesa, he, 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 back to Chiesa, and he's, he's just world class, you know. The way he drives up players and the, the way that he just eases past these players, he, he's, he's, he's like unlike, it's unlike anyone else, you know. And I think a player like him, you know, to drive from deep, you know, it's just with such pace he he he, he gets that plays you know but the players you know you can't stop him because he'll just switch it to the other foot and he'll switch it to the other foot and he, and he can use he's both footed as well so I think you know to have a weapon like with Chiesa you know how you they aren't doing really really good with Chiesa I mean, it's, it's just it it is it, it shows how bad Juventus are doing because Chiesa is just very very good and I think. You know, next summer, if we don't sign Mbappe, which it looks un very, very unlikely, but if we don't sign Mbappe, Chiesa has to be number one on that list, you know, because he's just perfect for Real Madrid and he just seems like a Real Madrid type player. It's been a while since we've had an Italian at the Bernabeu. Cannavaro, maybe, last we've had at the Bernabeu. Um, but but he, he just looks fantastic. So, should we move on to the next player quickly? Yeah, yeah, of course. Sergio Reguilon. Now, Tottenham left-back currently. But I think, you know, we don't need a left-back at this point. Miguel is doing very, very well. And I think he could improve defensively. But, you know, Miguel's doing well. Mendy's just coming back, which is, uh, I'm glad, just before the Shakhtar game. Um, as well as, you know, Marcelo, if we truly need him. So I think, you know, Reguilon, as much as one day I would like to see him back at the Bernabeu, if... Miguel doesn't turn out to be as good as he, as as good as he looks currently. He's got a forty million pound buyback clause in his contract, as, as you know. And you know people underrate him at Tottenham. You know, he's been Tottenham's one of Tottenham's best players last season. You know, in a poor season for Tottenham, really. Um, in the grand scheme of things, he fin they finished seventh, and I think you know, watching Tottenham every week, I think he he was. 
he was um, some of the best player, you know. I think, you know, he had a stinker against Aston Villa, I remember, earlier this season, where he just, he kicked, the, it was a really, really bad own goal. I just forget that, but Brighton was a fantastic player, but I just can't see a future for him at Real Madrid currently. Yeah, of course, and for now, I think Mendy first choice, Miguel, um, as his deputy for next season, so I don't think we need yeah, the, the money can be spent better anywhere else. So I think, sorry to say the right, regular, not, I love him. I want to see him at the Bonneville one day, once again. But, you know, he was the original Miguel, but I think it's just, it's not possible. 40 million, it's just, it's not possible at this moment in time. Yeah, 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 of course. I think um, it makes sense to pass on that opportunity. Yeah, okay. Next. If, if you were say that, then yes, but, you know. Yeah, OK. So next we have Victor Ozyman of Napoli. Now, I won't talk too much on that, on Victor Ozyman because I'm making a video on Napoli. Um, so he's he's been very good in Serie A this season. Six appearances and four goals. And I think, you know, I, was, I don't think Real Madrid was signing, let's be honest. And I think, you know, he's also got interest from Chelsea as well. He's 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 he had a stinker last season. To be honest, he his his um his his output. I remember from the stats I was looking at yesterday, he was, uh twenty four appearances, ten goals. It was very very poor from him. But he's he's looking very very good this season under uh, Luciano Spalletti. So I think you know he uh, good luck to him. But I don't think he's a round through type signing at this point in time. Yeah, I think um, there's not much more to add. He's a good player, but. Um, I think he might, if he comes to Madrid, he may have the season he had um, in the first one in Napoli. So um, I would pass on that opportunity as well. Yeah, and not to, let's not speak about the price tag Napoli paid on him. And they're going to certainly look for a profit on that, a big profit on that. So it's just not possible, really, for higher than 68 million, I think it was, uh, from yesterday's recording. So, yeah, I mean... Is, 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 he's a very, very, very good player, and I think I could see him at the top someday, but not right now. So, uh, sorry, Victor. Next and lastly, we have uh, Matthias De Ligt. Now, I've I've already recorded about Mat Matthias Ligt De Ligt um, two weeks ago in the podcast. Um, we talked. I talked about um, centre backs, potential centre backs for Real Madrid. And I talked about Matthias De Ligt and I talked about um, how he was a, the only generational uh, talent at centre-back. And I think I stand by that. He's the only generational centre-back. So I'm not going to talk about it too much because I've talked about this previously, but I want to get your opinion on it. I think if you have the opportunity to sign De Ligt, you will take you will take that chance. You will take the you will take um take on the opportunity on him. I think the timeline was just a bit messed up for Madrid in terms of delay because at that time uh, we had both Sergio Ramos and Rafael Varane at the time. And so um, I'm not gonna say there wasn't a need for the for, for him, but he definitely wasn't going to join if he wasn't going to start. Um, and I just think that we missed out on him. Uh, we missed out on him. And we, maybe we should have gone after him, you know, to maybe play as a first choice backup to Amos and Varane. And in that, sign, in that summer as well, um, I think we signed Edna Militao. Um, yeah, we signed Edna Militao that summer. Um, but however, no one predicted the fact that Sergio and Rafael would be leaving. But I think, I think he would definitely be um, one of the best um, centre backs for a decade. You know, I think in five, well, three to five years, he can be one of the best. It, like, when I mean the best, I mean top two, top three. In three years, I can definitely see it happening. He is a generational talent. Of course, there are guys like Kunde coming up and uh, from Meccano, but Dilit is, as Dilit is way better, in my opinion, and I think he's also a leader as well. So, if you're looking to sign a player to partner, Alaba can definitely be him. Um, or he can, and what I like about him, he's good as well with the ball on his feet. So that can also allow Alaba to, you know, play in multiple positions as well. It can be a military talent, in my opinion, and Alaba sometimes as his partner, but most likely Alaba would want to play in midfield, especially post, because uh, much like Casemiro, Alaba might want to try his hands in midfield. I'm not going to talk about Dillet and his price tag because it will be a lot 
But I'm just speaking on how good he will be for this team. You know, um, he can definitely, you know, take this team to the next level. You know, so um, if there's an opportunity to sign him, definitely I would sign him if you have the if you have the funds to do it. Because, like you said, he is going to be um, on top the top two, top three centre backs in the world for maybe his generation. Yeah. Okay. So that's the end of this section. Next section, we will be discussing. Our dis- defensive crisis ahead of the Shakhtar game. Join us after this short interval. Okay, in this part of the podcast, we will be discussing our defensive crisis and also whether we were right to let go of Sergio Ramos. Now, firstly, we'll start with the defensive crisis. Now, we've we've endured a few injuries in terms of the centre back position. In that, Militao has been injured on on international duty and he's come back halfway through and it just doesn't look good he's good he's most likely going to miss el Clasico as well as the Shakhtar game which is it's a, it's a huge blow isn't it i mean it, it's it's just not not what we needed and then a few few um hours after that we've we had news that alaba got a muscle overload so again it was just not very good but Alaba's muscle overload should only rule him out of the, uh, shouldn't rule rule him out of the, over the, uh, the Shakhtar game. He should be able to make it back in time, and he will be able to make it to, back in time for the for El Clasico. So, you know, ultimately this is not good, and this is what we feared at the start of the season: an injury crisis to just two players will make us go and play Vallejo. So. I think, you know, this is why we should have signed a centre-back at the start of the season. This is why, you know, in the previous section we discussed someone like Pepe could be very, very useful, you know, in January. Because something like this happens, we will be very, we will be done. Say if Vallejo got injured as well, and then suddenly we're looking at youth players coming in, Mario Gila coming in and playing centre-back for us. So I think, you know, it, it could mould a future style, but... <laughs> Is, is still a huge risk so I think you know Mendy's obviously coming back which is very very exciting you know for the first time in like six months for an injury that should have only ruled him out for a couple of weeks you know it, it's it's been a long time since we've seen Furlong Mendy uh, so what do you think what do you expect of Furlong Mendy in the Shakhtar game? Yeah I'm definitely happy to see Mendy back in the squad because I think Mendy will be a great addition I think um, the more players fit, the better for Madrid because we can definitely find a settled back four and then, you know, maybe we can start improving um, because we have a settled back four. Um, there is one of the biggest issues, in my opinion, which um, led to, you know, a lot of um, defensive lapses was because um, it, we just don't know who was going to play. Um, so I think the players are not felt like that because um, Nacho played at centre-back, then he would play at right-back, and he would play at left-back. Then he would play at left-back again and switch back to centre-back. Then he, I mean, that's not good for defence. If you don't know who's going to start, you're not going to strike up a, a, a partnership um, with, with your fellow defenders. I just think that I just think that there was so much uns- uncertainty, there weren't any stability in terms of um, consistency in the lineup. Um, which affected the defense first and foremost. So now with Mendy coming back, um, obviously Carvajal is coming back as well. That's definitely going to help the team in terms of finding balance, um, finding consistency, understanding the team is a bit more. Because when Mendy, Militao, Alaba, Carvajal plays, um, that's going to be for the very first time, and that's um, likely to be our back four. So. Um, I think the faster we get those players fit, um, the better, in my opinion, because then they're going to have the opportunity to build a relationship, build consistency, you know, in in terms of in terms of um, in terms of you know um, understanding each other more, understanding the positioning, like Sergio Ramos understood with Marcelo, you know, like Veran understood Sergio Ramos, you know, because you have to understand that wing backs actually contribute. To how centre back plays as well. So, do you think that because of the many entries that the team had, that that contributed, you know, to the slow start, the sluggish defending, the lack of understanding, how easy, how easy um, 
Alex Vidal was able to slice through our defense against Espanyol. Um, do you think that because um, there were so many um, changes in the defense that the defense didn't understand each other and that's what kind of affected us? Yeah, I mean, the we, we've we we've just been really poor and that, you know, the players just don't know each other that well. And I think, you know, we knew what was going to happen, you know, with the left-back situation at the start of the season. You know, not none of our left-backs truly understand their positioning like Mendy does, to be honest. You know, Alaba, you know, he, he always gets caught up, uh, up the field. Um, Miguel, he, he's still young. He doesn't truly understand the the positional side of, of, of the game. And I think with Marcelo, he's just too old. He, he tries to get up the field. He can't get back. So I think, you know, Mendy is just, he's just a positional Im- improvement. And if you don't have someone like like uh, Ramos at cent- left centre-back, you know, that will really cost you. And I think, you know, having someone like Alaba at left, uh, left centre-back, he's a very, very good centre-back in his, in his own right. But, you know, he's not the type of centre-back like Sergio Ramos. So I think, you know, ultimately having Mendy back is such a boost because... He's he, his his positional sense is much better than everyone else's at left back, and he and his recovery even if he is caught up upfield he will recover very very quickly he's, he's he's very very quick, so I think having Mendy back is such a such a very it's, it's so important. Before the Shakhtar game, we've 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 experienced Shakhtar before and we've experienced how good Shakhtar can be. We've experienced the worst in terms of against Shakhtar. And Shakhtar have improved, you know, they've brought in a kid called, um, uh, uh, I do apologise if I do get this wrong, it was uh, my, my Hallow, Mudrik, um, as well as Lucina Triore, ex-Ajax player. And, you know, these these guys have have, 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 uh, have improved uh, Shakhtar upon last year, you know. Tete absolutely run riot against us. Manuel Solomon, he did absolutely, won- he did wonders against us. And I think this will happen once again if we don't sort ourselves out. I think with Casemiro, we've got to find a new balance. And I think we've got to find the 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 way we played last year under Zidane, where we, you know, Cruz sat off in that in that deep line playmaker position just in front of the two centre backs. You know, having that extra body and and just you know Casemiro going up and down the field. Having that type of player, you know, adds an extra goal threat as well as, you know, some extra defensive numbers. And I think uh, Modric, you know, we saw last season, Modric, he pressed up high when whenever they were playing out from the back. He, he dropped whenever they were playing the long ball over the top. So I think, you know, if we play similar to that against um, against uh, Shakhtar, we will do well. Because ultimately, where Shakhtar thrive is on the... On the Counter attack. We know with the uh, Robert Robert uh, De Zerbi, ex Sassuolo coach. I saw this at Sassuolo last season, where they were just they were so good going forward, but they were just really really poor. So we know they're not going to be trying to do it under the counter attacking football. They're going to be trying to do direct, quick, quick up the field football, trying to catch the opponent out. We're not going to. They're not going to be sitting back and then springing forward. So I think, you know, I think. We've got to find a way to just, you know, stop the cut those passing lines to stop the stop the opposition. So that you know, this 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 is all defensive work, you know, because our defense has just not been good this season. So if we work this way, you know, defensively from the from the defense and all the way to attack, we we will win against Shakhtar. But you know, as we saw against against um, against uh, Sheriff. If we don't have the cutting edge, we ain't gonna do anything, let alone what the opposition do. So, what? Who would you stri- Who would you play on the wings? You know, knowing that this is what we should be doing. Definitely, um, I think when the CS and Trigo, um, they're such team players, in my opinion, and they can play on both sides of the game better than Hazard and Bale, in my opinion. Um, so I think Vinicius and Jago would be ideal for that. Um, that's why Zidane trusted them a lot um, at the latter stages, despite the fact that he knew that, of course, um, he may not get um, the attack and output he needed. But a defensive work um, takes a lot of energy. 
uh, takes a toll on the players and Vinicius and Rodrigo are young. Um, they can do it. They've done it previously, like I said, under Zidane. So I think these are the players that you're going to play. If you're going to look for defensive, um, for defensive um, output, um, you have to play uh, Vinicius and Rodrigo because Hazard's not going to give you that to a full extent. Um, and neither will be. If you're looking for players, you know, I think Vinicius and Rodrigo will definitely be the guys. Maybe Asensio can, can do a job also because he's not a, he's not a slouch defensively. Of course, his positioning is sometimes really off. But um, he, he will work off the ball and that's important. But then you're going to take away from Asensio because he's not a winger. And he wants to play in midfield. So because of that, Vinicius, Rodrigo, and of course a guy like Keiza. But uh, we don't have him, so I'm not going to speak on him. Um, so Vinicius, Rodrigo, um, of course if Hazard was younger, Hazard um, would have fit in well in terms of um, his energy levels. But I think... Um, you also can also play Fede Valverde um, out of position, like um, we have been doing. Um, but like I said, you know, with, when players are coming back, you know, um, it's going to make it easier for Madrid to build up a balance and, you know, build a chemistry. But defending isn't just um, with the centre backs, like you mentioned, it's in the whole structure of the team. So I think um, that's why. Very, very bad, but it has been moving about a bit and playing on the wings because there's um, Vinicius on the left, um, and of course, there's no one else to do it on the right. Bar or trigger, so very bad, but it basically has no choice but to be switched on to the right hand side to accommodate that. I would, I mean, if if we had Carval fit and available, I would play um, uh, Vasquez at right wing because you know. One thing you can say about Vasquez is, you know, his work rate is above anyone else in the team, in my opinion, you know, alongside maybe Valverde as well. You know, he's just, he, he works until the 90th minute, you know, he, he he gives his full full ability to Real Madrid for 90 minutes straight. So I think, you know, Vasquez, he, if he was right winger, if he could play right wing, but he has to. He has to play right wing back because otherwise you're going to have to play Vallejo at centre back and then Nacho at right back, which I just don't like at all. You know, I think we have to control the game because, you know, Vasquez is going to have to play right wing back and I think, therefore, you know, you can't play defensively, you can't play counter attacking when, when Vasquez is at right back, you know. So I think. Vasquez means we're gonna to have to play controlled possession football instead of trying to force uh, force something from the game, trying to trying to get get them to make a mistake here and there. We're gonna to have to we're gonna to have to play really really pragmatic. And I think if we do get a goal, we're gonna to have to sit on that goal for the whole game rather than go for a second, go for a third, go for a fourth. Because you know these are the properties that made Zidane uh, Zidane's Real Madrid so good in the second stint you know where we would just we get a goal and then we'd sit on that goal and hope for a second goal if if we're lucky if, uh, if if Benzema gets a little opportunity then we've got a second goal but i think we've got to we've got to get a goal within the early stages of the match to try and force Shakhtar to come at us try and force Shakhtar to to try and you know to not sit off and and i think you know, getting a goal this uh, that early will just force them to make errors and we'll get into their heads. You know, this week, Stacks are come off a 6-1 victory, which, you know, we saw last last time in the Champions League, Sheriff came off of a, a, a 7-0 win um, in, in against their rivals, Didamo Alto Tiraspol. So I think, uh, I think we've got to play defensively to to win this match you know I, I don't want a pretty win I don't, I don't want you know if we if we have to I, I don't care if, if we play pretty football to, to tomorrow I just want a win because the last few performances have been awful they've been truly awful you know Sheriff we put, we created loads of loads of chances but we just couldn't get a goal Villarreal we just we were just awful that, that game and Espanyol we were ripped apart by by Alex Vidal we're talking about Alex Vidal, a Barcelona flop. So this is this is this is more of a, a morale boost. We get the we get the goal we need. The 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 season's back on track, and I think 
that has to be the main value. Yeah, of course, you know, um, it's a definitely a game that we need to win. And I think Carlo Ancelotti um, had the entire international break, you know, to sort, to sort out the lapses and the defences, the defensive issues uh, from the team issues, the team structure, because it wasn't just the defence that, that, you know, that you can say was bad. There were times when we looked like it wasn't creating anything. Um, in, in a few um, games um, against Villarreal, they actually dominated possession. They had most of the ball, etc. So Carl Angelotti, you know, when we have had the entire international um, break to work on that, to see who he's going to play in the Classico, even with the injured players, now he has he had ample time to work on that. Um, so I think, uh, so I think that we cannot um, make much excuses if we feel this week we are not playing this weekend so that's that's going to make it easier for the players so um, I don't think that they are BSC or the players are tired um, because of course um, they're not playing this weekend they have ample time to recover from the international duties including the ones um, in South America so um, I don't think if we don't play well there won't be any excuse this time yeah Okay, just to quickly move on, we're going to go to the Sergio Ramos and was it, I'm going to ask for you this, 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 this firstly, do you think that it was right for us to sell Sergio Ramos, you know, a couple of months after the, after Sergio moved to PSG and it's, we've seen that Sergio Ramos has been, you know, constantly maintaining this injury issue, he's going to make his debut most likely. Um, so, do you think, do you think that Sergio, we were right to get get rid of Sergio Ramos? Okay, well, first there is two sides to this. Um, I was kind of um, two sided as well. Um, but personally, let me just uh, in terms of Sergio Ramos to understand the Sergio Ramos decision. I'm going to go back um, to the moment he left. Uh, of course, we signed Alaba. Um, before Sergio left and of course Sergio asked to stay and he was told that um, the option is no longer on the table. Um, why I would have kept Sergio Ramos back then was because I knew that everyone knew that Ferran is going to leave. Um, there was no persuading him. He made up his mind. He wants to leave. He wants something new. So Ferran was about to leave. And of course, if you're going to lose Ferran, of course you can't do Sergio Ramos as well. Um, of course, I would have loved if Sergio Ramos would have stayed at that time. I, love, I would have loved if Florentino Perez would have put the offer back on the table for him. Because we lost Ferran and if you if you lose both your centre-backs, that's definitely going to take the team a while, you know, to make up for it, to adjust it, to adapt it. So I would have loved Sergio Ramos to stay Then he went to PSG. And everyone was a bit bitter. And of course, he had all those injuries and much advance kind of forgot. Um, about the fact that we really wanted him to stay because he would have definitely helped us out at the start of the season. But then he got injured. And I was a bit confused because Sir Chalmers was fit. And maybe if he had stayed in Madrid, um, he would have started the season with the team a bit earlier. Um, and then maybe he may not have gotten the injury. But of course, you know, you can see that maybe his body is uh, weighing down a bit due to the constant overload he puts on himself. And that's maybe what contributed to the injuries because if I could remember, Sergio Ramos was fit. And however, um, because of the injuries he's having now, uh, I think that we were right to let him go uh, because, of course, the money he'd have been on. And I think, you know, I would have loved him to stay to have the farewell he deserved at the Santiago Bernabeu. However, but in terms of fitness and performance wise, I think it looks like the right decision. However, if Sergio Ramos comes back for PSG this weekend, he builds up a string of games on fitness. You know, a PSG have a deep run in the Champions League as Sergio Ramos being at the heart of it. You know, then, yeah, we were wrong to let him go because I know that he can definitely come back. Um, because if you look at it, if you look at it this way, if Jesus Valeo hasn't played a game this season, um, we have Alba, Militao and Nacho Cabo in the centre-back position. But I think that we could have hold on to Ramos um, until he's fit again, then he can contribute, then we make a decision on next year, in my opinion. Because you don't need four centre-backs directly at the start of the season unless there's a major injury crisis. 
I think Sergio Ramos may not have picked up the injury. Maybe if he has stayed in Madrid, you know, I mean, you never know. But definitely he would have helped us out. He would have been a good asset to have in the team. You know, they had definitely two sides to the financial aspect. And, you know, the, and even when the performance aspect, they had two sides to it as well in that aspect alone. You know, um, because definitely he may not have been playing and it would have been a bit difficult in, in my opinion. But Valeo hasn't been utilized as yet, so definitely if Sir was had taken up that spot, you know, um, he could have been um, just there until he's fit, then he can win back his place in the starting lineup because um, you're saying that Pepe would be a good addition to what if we had Sir Ramos, you know, just the last us this season, you know. Um, so what do you think about um, Sir Ramos? So we, we all know that Sergio Ramos is going to want to bounce back once his injury is over. He's going to hit. We all know Sergio's mentality is just going to be, he's going to be so motivated to get back and become the, you know, become the feared defender once again, you know. And I think, you know, in that game against Chelsea, he was shown to to be really, really poor. He was, he was, he was outclassed by Mason Mount and... Kai Havertz, as much as we didn't want to admit that at, the, at that time, because we knew that we, he was probably going to sign the contract at that time. But, you know, I just felt like this this current moment in time, it just feels like, you know, if if we had signed Sergio Ramos, you know, what was it? It was like for how much money was it? Um, what do you mean, as in his wages? Yes, his wages. I think it's like 12 million per season. Uh, yeah, so I mean that would have been um, about three million just then, just like just within these last few months where we've just been injured, and I think that, that would have just been that's just not acceptable at this moment in time. You know, he might bounce back and bounce back to become the best best centre back in the world once again, but you know, at age thirty six, it's it's just not it's not very likely. You know, as much as he he has the warrior instinct and he wants to get back, he's not, it's not, it's not, it doesn't work like that. Unfortunately, he's 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 not he's not at an age to do that. He's not he's not Van Dyke age where he can just say, okay, I've had a year out of, of football. However, I'm just gonna get straight back into it and like like I was never gone. And yeah, no one will question it. It's 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 not like that for Sergio Ramos. He has he has to take a bit of time off. Now, that's probably why. Um, that's probably why he isn't going to make his debut this weekend. I'm not. I'm not sure, but I think, you know, so good luck to Sergio. I, I hope he does well in, in PSG as much as I don't want PSG to do well. Um, but nonetheless, I think, you know, we did make the right decision. You know, eventually we would have had to get rid of Sergio Ramos. You know, it, it's not like he he was eternal. He, we had to get rid of him at some point. Why not do it when when he when he could not get rid of any more money from our club, you know. He could not, you know, hoover a bit more money up. You might as well just get rid of him when he when when he's thirty when he's thirty six, and you could get a, a replacement next summer. You know, Delict maybe maybe Pal Torres maybe Laporte, but I think ultimately Sergio Ramos. Good luck to him, but I think it is probably best. It was probably best that we parted ways this this um, summer. Yeah, yeah, of course, I agree with you there. Of course, there is a lot of um, attachment to Sergio Ramos in terms of what he did for this team. And, of, of course, every Real Madrid fan will admit that, you know, um, we would have loved him to stay because of it's Sergio Ramos. You know, it isn't just any random defender uh, who's 36 years old. So, we all have a lot of affection for Sergio Ramos. Um, of course, um, of course um, Sergio Ramos definitely will contribute to Madrid if he's fit. But, Maybe like the way you said it, you know, um, and maybe it was the right time. You know, you have to move on from him at some point in time, and you just sign Alaba. You can build a team around Alaba and have other defenders that come with Alaba as well. You know, so yeah, I think yeah, it maybe was the right time. You know, to be six years old. At some point in time, you have to do it, just like you have to with Benzema um, in two to three years. You know, which that obviously will be a bit sad as well, losing Benzema. You know, obviously, because we all have a lot of affection and admiration for what he did for us, definitely we are going to 
defend them and look for ways to incorporate them. Uh, but however, when you lose players, it will contribute to the team's um, performance. If you have players for decades, 17 years, definitely the team will need to adapt to, it, adapt to losing a player like that. But you have to lose him at some point in time, and his powers are definitely waning away. And now was definitely the best time. Um, obviously, we all had hoped that you know that he maybe could have stayed and had one last season. Um, the last dance at Madrid, like they say these days, well, back in the day. But um, maybe now was the best time when, obviously, he had a lot of injuries and you can see, you know that he's going to slow down this season. So, yeah, now was the best time. It was a bit sad, but it's something that had to be done. And now we have to move on and look to the future. Yeah, I totally agree with you. So, um, have you got anything else to add on the our defensive issues or our team against Shaq or or anything about Sergio Ramos before the end? Well, to summarise all of that in one, definitely when you lose both Sergio and Rafael in one season, the team will take a while to adapt and build chemistry. Um, so the, the, there will be a lot of defensive issues and defensive lapses, defensive miscommunication, you know, um, in terms of the understanding of the players. And that's going to fall in together soon when, the, when more players are fit. Um, Kavahal Mendy as well, you know, are they going to help, you know, in sustaining the back line, you know, because they are the first choice and the team will adapt to it, you know, so I just think again, Shakhtar, it's a must-win game, there isn't any excuses, the team is fresh, um, Carlo Ancelotti had two weeks to work on, you know, um, at the attacking combinations to break them down, you know, to work on the intensity of the team, he has an idea who's going to be fit, who's going to play. Um, now, um, now that everyone is back, you can evaluate them and see when they're going to play. So, I hope that um, he, he makes the right choices because this is an important week, Shakhtar than Barcelona. So, I hope that he gets his decisions correct because that's obviously what's going to shape, um, shape out how the game ends. Yeah, okay. So, that's the end of today's podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, let's hope for good games against Shakhtar and against Barcelona. Let's hope we beat both of them because, let's be honest, we need it. So, um, thank you guys for listening and I will see you guys later. Bye-bye.